Okay, so as you know, Apple recently announced the M3 Ultra, and that was a bit of a surprise because we're already into the M4 series. However, the important thing about the M3 Ultra is it carries on the same philosophy as the previous Ultra chips, in that it uses the Ultra Fusion interconnect, effectively taking two M3 Max chips and fusing them together with this special interconnect. So I thought it'd be worth doing a deep dive into that interconnect to find out why it's important and what it possibly means for the future. So if you want to find out more, please let me explain. Now Apple's processors, which we commonly know as Apple Silicon, are quite unique in the industry in that Apple doesn't need to sell its processors to anybody else. So big companies like Intel or AMD, they want to sell their processors to other people and therefore they have a huge range of processors available, various different price points, performance points, energy efficiency uh, points because they want to sell it to whichever customer wants it. Now Apple doesn't need to do that because the only customer it has is itself which means it builds what it wants. It doesn't need to kind of hedge its bets and say, well, maybe they want this, maybe they want that. It knows what it wants, and those are the chips that it builds. It's also different to Intel and AMD in that it's using the ARM instruction set rather than x86, so that makes it quite different to the rest of the industry. And also it's different because it builds SOCs. It doesn't just build a CPU and a package and then you stick in an external GPU and an external something else. Uh, it's actually all on the one package system on a chip, very much like what we've got with smartphones, but now moved up into laptops and into desktops. That means you get a CPU, a GPU, an NPU, a display engine, a media engine, lots and lots of stuff, a Thunderbolt 5, all built into this one chip. And the other thing that's very important about Apple's design is that it's scalable. And we can see this very much in the range of chips that they have announced. Basically, they take that first design, the M3, the M4, and then they scale it up. You get the Pro, the Max, and the Ultra. And that's very, very unique. You don't get that very much in the rest of the industry in that there are building blocks that they just keep scaling up on depending on what particular segment, what air, what market they're trying to sell into. So if we look at some of that scaling, for example, the M3, the vanilla one, is an eight core CPU, 10 core GPU. Then they go up a bit at a time. The M3 Pro, 12 core CPU, 18 core GPU, M3 Max 16 core CPU, 40 core GPU, then the M3 Ultra 32 core CPU and 80 core GPU. And the important thing there is to note that the M3 Ultra is double exactly what you've got in the M3 Max, and that's because it is two M3 Maxes joined together with this internet, and we'll talk more about that uh, in a second. Onto the M4, same again, 10 core CPU, 10 core GPU, the Pro version 14 core, 20 core, the Max version 16 core, 40 core. So as they go through the different levels, uh, the vanilla, the Pro, the Max, uh, Apple choose how many different CPU cores they want. Of course, they're divided into uh, high efficiency cores and performance cores, then how many GPU cores it wants, and they offer different. And then when you get to the Ultra version, they take two of those max ones and stitch them together using the Ultra Fusion interconnect. Now, here is a quick diagram of the M3 Ultra. I've made that myself. It's not something from Apple because they didn't release one. But the pictures for the M3, the M3 Pro and the M3 Max are all from Apple. And then I took the M3 uh, Max and I kind of stuck them together using the uh, interconnect that was actually shown on the M1. Uh, so that's kind of my artistic, uh, you know, demonstration of what it is. But literally, it is two dies that are connected together using the Ultra Fusion Interconnect. And this is really important. Why would Apple do that? Well, if you look at the size of it, you can see as the M3 grew in size, yes, it did, it got bigger and bigger and there are more cores and more GPU cores. But when you want to go double, then you, of course, literally double the size of the die. And that's hard from a manufacturing point of view, hard from a yield point of view, hard from a cost point of view. So it actually works out that it's much better uh, to take two of those dies and stitch them together using the interconnect. Now, one thing I would like to address, I did read in some of my comments that people were claiming that Apple have been kind of saving up binned versions of the M3 Max 
waiting till they had enough of them kind of sitting around on a shelf somewhere and then when they were ready with that they kind of started stitching them together for the M3 Ultra. That's simply not true because the M3 Ultra has Thunderbolt 5 and it's only in the M3 Ultra and in the M4 uh, Max. Okay, so you don't get Thunderbolt 5 in the previous versions of the M3. So this is something unique. So if you took an M3 Ultra and kind of split it down the middle with the scalpel, if you could do that, and then try to build an M3, uh, normal M3 chip, it's not the same chip. It's not exactly the same chip. Of course, it's the same general design, but um, they've actually not just said, oh, we've got some spare silicon sitting around. Ones that didn't quite work, we'll stitch them together. That's not what happened. And as well as scaling for CPU and GPU and so on, we can also see there is RAM scaling. So the original M3 could have up to 24 gigabytes of RAM, the M3 Pro 36 gigabytes, 128 gigabytes, and now the M3 Ultra, an enormous 512 gigabytes, which is absolutely uh, amazing. Uh, and the M4 the same, 32 gigabytes, 64 gigabytes, the M4 Max, 128 gigabytes. Now to do that, they also scale up the number of memory controllers. So as we can see, 8, 12, 32, and then double that, 64 in the M3 range, 8, 16, 32, in the uh, M4 range. Now the memory controllers are, of course, are speaking to LPDDR5 and 5X, and those are 16-bit wide channels, because that's how LPDDR5 works. And basically they have many, many of these controllers spread out across the whole memory. Think about 512 gigabytes of RAM. Well, what you actually need is you many, many of these controllers. In fact, you end up with an effective uh, bus that is 1024, 1024 bits wide accessing that memory and of course that is gives you great bandwidth. So as I mentioned the M3 Ultra is two M3 Maxes stitched together using Apple's Ultra Fusion interconnect. Now that interconnect is a custom chip to chip communication architecture designed to link two Apple Silicon dies in one unified SOC. Uh, SOC. We first sit in the M1 Ultra, which effectively fuses two M1 Max chips together into a single high performance uh, processor. By using an in package silicon interposer, that's the physical way that they are connected together, the two dies are joined together, it can carry over 10,000 signals between the two dies at an incredibly throughput of 2.5 terabytes per second. Now this enables the connected dies to behave as if they are a single coherent chip from uh, a software point of view. Now this is important when you have such a huge bandwidth available with low latency, the chip designers basically have freedom to put this together however they want. If it was a very narrow a low bandwidth connector, then they'd have to be very selective saying, well, well, we'll go and ask for that, but we need to reduce what we're asking for. Is there a way we can cut a corner? Is there a way we can save some time and space here? And you would end up kind of with a hodgepodge design that doesn't really do what you expect because you're always worried about how am I going to communicate from one die to the other die. But the moment you have a very wide a connector between them with low latency, the chip designers can say, well, we'll just talk to the other die. So whether it's about, you know, loading up the GPUs, whether it's about seeing what's in the cache, whether it's about cache snooping, whether it's about what's going on to the next CPU core to execute, then that wide uh, connector, interconnector, allows the chips designers to do uh, whatever they want. Now, the internals of how those different components speak to each other, GPU, CPU, display drivers, media encoders, all that, is a thing called the chip fabric. And that chip fabric is proprietary to Apple. They don't have to adhere to a particular standard because they're not selling their individual design blocks, the CPU or the GPU, to anybody else. So they have to interface to something standard. They can use whatever system they want to come up with to make the most efficient and high performance connectors between the different things. Now, I'm sure there are similarities between what already exists out there. They're not going to reinvent the wheel, but they don't have to be compliant to any particular standard, they can talk internally to, to the different components however they want. And that's also true of the Ultra Fusion 
uh, interconnect, they can decide, well, what is the protocol for snooping uh, into the cache, for looking in the cache on the other die there? Well, they can do that themselves however they want to. Now, one interesting thing to note is that the CPU clusters don't span from one die to another. So the CPUs are grouped together uh, in clusters. So of course, you've got the performance cores, you've got the efficiency cores, and they come together in little clusters, uh, which provide things like power domains and, and clock domains and so on. Won't go into all of that now. Uh, but they don't have a cluster that spans two, uh, two parts of a die. So if a cluster is on, uh, you know, on the chip, it's on that same bit of the die, because there are then other clusters on the other die, and they communicate caching, and the data bus, and the address bus, and the memory bus, and all that kind of the I.O. buses, are all that go over the uh, ultrafusion interconnect. Now, this is very different to a conventional multi-chip setup where you then have to go across some kind of interface, whether that's across the motherboard, across a socket. This is actually an inter -die link. So it's really an extension of the on-chip fabric, but now going across two dies. Now, it's also worth mentioning that from a power efficiency point of view, this uh, interlink is very wide. By that, I mean it can send lots of data in parallel, okay? And in doing that, it doesn't need to be so high speed. And of course, it is high speed, because we're talking megahertz and gigahertz here, okay? So it's not very slow, but you don't need to make it ultra fast because you're trying to squeeze a lot of data down a very narrow uh, bandwidth. So if I give you an example, if I wanted to take the word Gary, okay, I could say, give me a G, yeah, give me an A, yeah, and, and so on. And if I wanted that to come quickly, I'd have to get those letters very, very quickly, one after the other. Alternatively, I could say, give me a Gary, and I get G-A-R-Y in one go, okay? That's the difference. Now, it, this uh, interconnect is very wide, so you could ask for lots and lots of data in one go, rather than, say, lots of ones and zeros that are going ultra fast down a very, very narrow pipe. Hopefully that will make you understand the advantage of having high bandwidth, but not necessarily high clock speed. Of course, that really helps in terms of the interconnect working because you haven't got so many timing issues. Now, one interesting thing about the uh, ultrafusion interconnect is the GPU. Now, when you're dealing with, let's say, the media encoder, you send something down the bus over the internet, you say, do that bit of work. That's fair enough. But the GPU is now split over two dies which are two different bits of silicon that have been joined together using the silicon interposer, but you want them to behave as one. Now that provides a challenge for the chip designer because you don't want it to be like a PC with two graphics cards in it. And you know, it says graphics card one, graphics card two, and you try to, on a software level, give out the, the you know, you can have the top half of the screen, you can have the bottom half of the screen, and we're kind of linked together at the other end. We're not talking about that kind of stuff. We're talking about, from a software point of view, this appears as one GPU. And again, the interconnect allows that to happen. Because they have that high bandwidth and that low latency, then the GPU designers can say, well, if I want to treat that core on the other die as part of the same GPU, I can talk to it. I've got the bandwidth and the latency, I can talk to that, and it, from a software point of view, it just seems to be one big GPU. And that's what Apple managed to achieve, not only with the M3 Ultra, but with the M2 Ultra and the M1 Ultra, that is what they achieved. Now, thinking of the future, one interesting aspect is, can this be used to link multiple dies together? So at the moment, it's really a chip-to-chip -chip, uh, internet that connects two dies together. Can they connect three or four or, or more uh, together? Now, at the moment, that hasn't been what we've seen. And what's interesting is that the M3 Ultra was quite late to the game. What do I mean by that? The M1 Ultra and the M2 Ultra came out about six months after the Max versions of the respective series. So you got the M1 Max and then six months later you got the M1 Ultra. However, the M3 Ultra turned up 18 months after the M3 Max. And in fact, by then we were already into the M4 series, all the way up to the M4 Max. Now, of course, there are many, many rumors going around about what's that about? Why did that happen? Now, one possibility is that Apple have been trying to make greater configurations. This is pure speculation on my part. And were unable to do that. And so they had to stick with the plan they already knew, which was the M3 Ultra in the same design 
uh, style as the M2 Ultra and the M1 Ultra. Now, the fallout of this is we have learned a couple of things. One is that the M4 Max does not have the interconnect. So the interconnect only exists on the Max version. So you can't have a, a, an M3 Pro joined to another M3 Pro using it. It's not there. The, the interconnect is not on the M3 uh, Pro. It's only on the Max one. So you've got it on the M1 Max, the M2 Max, and the M3 Max. And that then leads to the Ultra version. Now, the M4 Max does not have the interconnect on it. So we're not going to see an M4 Ultra. So what will we see? Well, there are two possibilities. One is that Apple has looked at the market. It's selling its chips to itself. It's building Macs, it's building MacBooks, iMacs, Mac Studios. It's building all of these computers. And it decides, well, actually, the sales in this segment are not as high as we expected. So we're not going to concentrate on that. So there could be some business decisions to do with sales, to do with R&D costs, do with manufacturing costs, to do with profit margins, where Apple say, we're not going to concentrate on that segment. I have no idea, but that is one possibility. The other possibility is that this is kind of the edge of what you can achieve with the UltraFusion Interconnect. That's partly why the M3 uh, Ultra took so long to come out. To get it right completely took a lot longer. And this is kind of the edge, which means Apple are now working on something else. And we don't know what that something else is. It could be just bigger monolithic dies. Maybe manufacturing has improved. Maybe the costs and the yields of that have improved so that you can get bigger and bigger monolithic. So kind of an M3 Max Plus, something a bit bigger. Or there could be an Ultra Fusion 2 coming, uh, which would be a different design. Won't be the same design. Maybe it's multi-point. So not just two dies that are joined together. Maybe you can have three, four or something like that. Or maybe it is a different way of joining dies together that uh, is kind of in a matrix. We don't know. But one thing we do know is there won't be an M4 Ultra, but I'm sure that Apple aren't giving up on how it wants to expand its uh, SOC designs. Now, of course, now we're in a world where we're talking about large language models and we're seeing the benefit of the unified memory and other products being announced by companies like NVIDIA, for example, are showing in unified memory uh, models. And then they're saying you can have 128 uh, gigabytes and you can use our processor and our GPU. OK, so that's the world we're now living in. And this is not going to go away. So large language models are here to stay and we need the bandwidth. We need the memory and we need the processing power to actually make those uh, work. So. Could there now be a greater uh, innovation coming down the pipeline after UltraFusion that allows even more dies to be stitched together? I don't know, but it's certainly going to be interesting to find out. OK, that's it. My name's Gary Sims. This is Gary Explains. I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do give it a thumbs up. And if you like these kind of videos, why not stick around by subscribing to the channel? OK, that's it. I'll see you in the next one. <laughs>